Well, good morning, Revolution. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week. Scott, you got on your party shirt. Well, 100 years. Um, I also got my mug here. Uh, it says our first century of progress. That's a good way of looking at it. This is the end of our first century. Um, it's the, the beginning of, of, of another one. Um, our, our, our 100th anniversary is on Sunday. Happy birthday, CPUSA. Happy birthday. We're having a program, folks, Sunday night at 8 o'clock. We'll be streaming live here on Facebook. And by the way, while we're at it, please click on the button, you know, um, make this launch party. Share the show. Launch, launch party. Share the socialist wealth with your <laughs> friends and neighbors. All you got to do is click on it. And then you can choose who you who you uh, send it to. So Scott, it's been a uh, for August. It's been a quite a week. Your president went to uh, Europe and uh, came back, and they caused a whole lot of craziness there. And uh, the usual level of craziness. The usual level of uh, craziness. He didn't want to meet with Iran. Uh, the French invited him uh, there. And uh, he bonded with that uh, crazy surrogate guy from the UK. What's his name? Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson. Uh, yes. He's actually apparently very personable, um, but is politically complete garbage. I mean, he's a he's he's practically a fascist. Well, and then he suspended uh, a part. So we should try to get somebody from the British Party here next week to see what you know, they say about yep. the exit situation and uh, the position of the left and the labor movement um, uh, in that uh, great country. Um, and then Comey, Comey got, uh, I guess, a, a dinged by the Justice Department for his handling of the, the memos. Um, yeah, I'm not going to spend a lot of time defending the, the FBI, but, you know, how could I'm concerned the man did the country a service trying to expose uh, what was going on. Don't tell the Clinton campaign that because they, they uh, are happy uh, with him because of that letter that he released two weeks before the election. I think that it cost them the election. I think that it may have contributed, but there were a lot of factors that went into it, including not going to Michigan. Yeah, uh, you know what was that about? And then the FBI, speaking of which, raided the home of the head of the UAW. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, when they were just about to, uh, and uh, when they're in contract negotiations and had just taken a strike authorization vote, so mm -hmm. it's pretty clearly an attempt to um, disrupt their their organization and their um, their their plans to try to win a better contract. We have a Communist Party Labor Commission, and uh, they'll be reporting to our national board in a couple of weeks. And so we'll be sharing their thinking on what's going on in the labor movement and what are the steps uh, forward. Labor up front, that has to be part of our slogan going forward. It's really, really important. So why do we, what, um, why, why the labor movement? We, talk, we know the working class is much broader than the labor movement. Uh, union density is is very very uh, low in this country because of sustained attacks from the uh, from the right with the participation of of some forces in the Democratic Party. Um, why why do we why do we insist on this uh, leading role of the uh, of the organized workforce? Well, because they're organized. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> they're organized. They have. Uh, resources in, in terms of cadre membership, uh -huh. experienced people who have experience and struggle. They have Their connections, they, they have, have financial resources, you know, uh, and they have an independent structure, which is the most important thing. One of the things that uh, the early Marxist uh, always pointed out that was central to the class struggle was the need for the political independence of the working class. And the labor movement has independent structures. They, they do their own phone banking, their own get out the vote during election. And they've been doing it more and more over the past, um, I think, 
couple decades, really. It's been a, a long time building. And you know, now it's, it's built to the point where labor is actually running its own candidates um, yes. as well. Uh, and so we're seeing the fruits of this, this, uh, this organization and this infrastructure that, that working people have built for themselves. It's extremely important. But on the other side of it, you know, there are huge numbers of workers who are not organized and we have to pay attention to that uh, also. Speaking of uh, independent uh, uh, politics, well, it's not quite independent, but the Democratic primary, in fact, is not independent at all. <laughs> the, Democratic, the Democratic, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, the Democratic primary, um, Warren, Elizabeth Warren seems to be surging, huge crowds in Seattle, and then in, uh, what was the other state? Uh, uh, 15,000 people uh, seems to be catching fire, you know? I hear she's a favorite, is that true? Um, you know, I, I think Warren's candidacy is really interesting um, because she's not um, sort of ideologically flashy. She's very, very uh, pragmatic. She mm. did not, um, you know, she, uh, she does not identify as a socialist, of course. Um, and yet she is advancing very progressive ideas and people are responding to them extremely positively. Mm. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a positive step that the, the mass media is, you know, weaning themselves off their, you know, they, they have this whole thing, oh, got to find the most centrist, moderate appeal to the conservatives, this and that, you know, Beto, Biden, whoever. Um, but now the, the tide seems to be turning and they're, they're looking to, uh, to Warren, which is a, a big move for them. Um, well, I want to see what the working class, what the, what the working class is going to choose. You know, my position, we don't endorse, but I'm welcoming in this socialist moment, the candidacy of Sanders and, but also the other uh, women and uh, people of color LGBTQ um, uh, candidates, you know, um, they'll, I think they'll this, fight it out. This, this primary, like people seem to, a lot of, a lot of Democrats seem to be nervous uh, about this primary. I don't think there's cause to be. I think it's, it's extremely exciting mm. um, to see that there, I mean, we know that the Democratic Party is not homogenous, right? It, it's got all kinds of different currents and forces and, and tendencies. And the primary process is one of the ways in which that gets um, translated into kind of uh, institutional power and direction. And yeah, so um, get out there and, and, you know, pick your candidate, uh, work for them, and but don't let it distract from, from unity against the, the Trump regime, because that's what that's the main task. Well, I'm glad you made that point because as much as it is an anti-socialist movement where socialism is gaining currency and debate, it's an anti-right moment, even more so in many respects, and, uh, and an anti-racist moment. And in fact, it has to be because of the gross centrality of Trump's use of race baiting uh, as a wedge issue in this election. And, and those two have always gone, it, it makes sense. Those two have always gone together. Like red baiting and, and racism have always gone hand in hand. And so it makes sense that this moment of, of the growing class consciousness, growing interest in socialism um, should be fueled by uh, and, and, and part of this movement of rejection of, of racism and of all forms of discrimination. You know, they used to say the barbarians are at the gates, you know, but Hell no, the barbarians are in the White House. And you know what they did the other day? They are going to deny immigrants who have life-threatening conditions uh, uh, sanctuary in hospital. They're sending them back. There's a 15-year-old girl, 14, you know, who, if she is deported, will die. And they don't give a merry blankety blank. They're just, you know, these are... And that's the thing, like they, um, so everybody's, everybody, a lot of people say, oh yeah, Trump just says out loud what everybody's thinking, whatever. So 
I would put that a little bit differently. I think what he does to to immigrants is what what the entire right is willing to do to the working class, right? If somebody is willing to um, lock up children in cages because they stepped over an imaginary line, they're the fact that you have a passport is not going to stop them. In fact, we've seen U.S. citizens uh, being targeted by uh, by ICE, detained. Um, you know, they don't care. They don't care. They can just if you're a person of color, they want you out. I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah. By the way, I read a really interesting article uh, about the debate that W.E.B. Du Bois had with this uh, ardent. Uh, a racist person in the uh, 20s, I guess it was. And uh, he was a, a architect of uh, influential, he wrote a number of pseudoscientific books about uh, race and uh, so on and so forth. And a big part of that movement was this anti-immigrant legislation, which became law. And so for two or three generations, the Italians and the Irish, as a result of that, were denied entry into the United States. To say nothing of, you know, Asians, Africans, and other people of uh, uh, color. Well, we got a, a letter in the mail today that we wanted to address. Uh, uh, share the. the so, um, somebody wrote to us in our our, our virtual Facebook uh, mailbox and and said, you know, uh, I'm not sure about CPUSA, um, but you have my attention. I consider myself more of a socialist. I'm disgusted with what's going on in the government. Uh, and uh, I'm ready to drop my Democratic Party registration. Uh, the only thing is how do we convince people to look beyond the Stalins and Hitlers of the world? Um, so I thought in answering this, we could, I don't know. Actually, what, what are your thoughts, Joe, before I, I jump in here? Well, first we're socialists too. I mean, in the sense that we believe in socialism and, um, you know, not socialism light, though we would take that too as a step towards socialism. Mm -hmm. I always say that the uh, people who call themselves socialists are in, are in favor of socialist measures. We have a lot of things that we can unite on. Um, and it's a door to begin talking about our concept of socialism, which is uh, a working class led state and economy democratically uh, run, administered, and distributed. Well, and, and it's really, there, so on that socialism question, there's, it's just sort of two different ways of, of cutting into the apple, right? Um, on the one hand, we can think of socialism as a set of measures like universal health care, free education, guaranteed housing, um, advanced uh, workplace and political democracy. Uh, higher wages, higher standard of living, environmental protection. So that's looking at it from the, what are we going to get out of socialism? And I think a lot of the people, almost everyone who identifies as a, a socialist, broadly, uh, whether democratic socialist, plain old socialist, communist, whatever, agrees on most of that stuff. Um, we also look at it from the other side, which is to say, what has to happen in order to get those things. Right? We can't get them under capitalism. And even if we can, they can be taken away. Like the New Deal got stripped away from us. It wasn't socialism, but it was a step. And it's now we've taken a step backward. So we think that that working class power, putting the working class in control of the economy and the state is necessary to get all of those um, advanced democratic and socialist reforms. Part of which I would add to that wonderful list that you projected, anti-racist and anti-racist uh, measures that uh, capitalism is not capable of, uh, of effecting and bringing into being. Uh, but on the issue of <laughs> Stalin and, uh, you know, all of that kind of thing, you know, you got to re remember that socialism uh, is new to the world historically. Um, and at one time, capitalism was new to the world. And it took about two centuries before bourgeois democracy began to develop and flourish in the developed capitalist countries. And during that two centuries, oh my God, all hell broke loose. You know? and, and two two is a conservative estimate. I mean, if we if we if we think of the beginning of capitalism around 1500, 
sort of its first the the, the stage of what um, Sven Beckett calls uh, war capitalism. Um, it was four centuries before bourgeois democracy was firmly implanted. Really well. And when they first started out, the emerging bourgeoisie, we call them, they didn't know how to rule. In fact, Machiavelli wrote a book called The, the Prince, which was a handbook of teaching people, the arising classes, how to rule. You know, we wouldn't accept all of those uh, measures. Um, you shouldn't pretend to be uh, the lion or the fox, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as he said, but, um, you know, that was why. But the Communist Party has done the same thing. In fact, Antonio Gramsci wrote a book called The Modern Prince, in which he put forward a lot of the ideas about how the emerging working class movement and the emerging working class party needs to a rule. The point I want to make is that, you know, in China and the Soviet Union, socialism came into the world through the back door, you know? And they took a lot of measures that uh, we wouldn't uh, agree with, but they were seeking to defend their revolutions. And in the course of which, you know, crimes were committed. There's no question about that. But the working class is learning how to rule and in a number of countries, in India, you know, in Chile, in Brazil, in, in Cuba. Europe, in Cuba, uh, you have new forms of working class power that are emerging. We're learning how to govern. Um, and um, next time around, Socialism 2.0, we're going to do it with grace and style, principle. <laughs> and, well, and, and, and history's moving and democracy. I forgot about democracy. <laughs> I mean, think about it. The first socialist revolution was in 1871, right? The Paris Commune? No, 1871. Yeah, right. Paris Commune. It lasted for a couple months. Right. Um, the next one was in 1917. It lasted for 70 years and became a superpower. Um, the Chinese Revolution um, took many uh, sort of turns, but it's still, they're still uh, figuring out how to develop socialism. The Cuban Revolution has not been defeated. Um, so, yeah, we're we're learning. We're learning quickly. The working class is is figuring this out, and we, it's it's a matter of time and organization. And uh, hard work, and adherence to principle, and so we stand for what we call a Bill of Rights socialism in the United States, based on our own history, traditions, uh, and uh, culture. There are no universal models. We gotta do our own thing here. And so we invite the reader, join the Communist Party, help us shape it, you know? That's, that's the key. That I is wanna add, like, what, one of the things, I think the, the main thing that makes us different in my mind than a lot of other political parties is that, you know, we keep our eyes in, in two places. Um, on the one hand, on the very, very immediate, very concrete struggles, what are the what are the goals that are being fought for right now? Who's in the fight? How can we get involved? How can we build unity? Um, which is something you don't see in, in some other left parties. Um, on the other hand, we also look beyond those immediate struggles to the framework for solving these contradictions and actually making a durable, transformative change in society. So I think it's the, I think you need both of those things. I think we, we do it better than anybody. Um, or we're at least on a better track. <laughs> so that's my mm -hmm. plug. Join the Communist Party. It's, uh, it's been wonderful. And once again, we'll be celebrating our 100th birthday on Sunday, 100 years strong, you know? That's an accomplishment and the biggest and most powerful and most ruthless ruling class in modern history, uh, maybe in our history. Um, and uh, Scott, you got the last word. Um, um, I just wanted to sort of thank the, the comrades and the other folks who, who tune in and watch us and um, send us messages and questions um, from all around the world, really. It, it's wonderful. Uh, your support means a lot to us. Um, and yeah, uh, please tune in on Sunday and solidarity forever, like the song says. All right. That does it. Take care. See you on Sunday, eight o'clock. Same uh, place, 
Same station, 8 p.m. Eastern. Take care. Take care, Joe.